Greetings from Brother Stephan. I'm a disciple and witness of Jesus Elohim. To all the inhabitants of the earth, I present you as a witness the gospel of the kingdom. In this lesson today, titled The Parable of the Two Sons, we will be going over Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 through 32. We did go over this subsection of scriptures um, recently in the study titled um, Pharisees versus Publicans. When we cover some subsections in Luke, um, in this lesson, we're going to particularly focus on this parable and try to explain everything in detail as we go through it. Um, so, beginning with Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 to 32, again, the parable of the two sons, beginning at verse 28. But what think you? A certain man had two sons. Now these two sons is a repentant son and an unrepentant son. And he came to the first. So the first thing we're going to do in this parable is explain the significance of the first. Um, to do this, we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 19. Verses 16 to 30, a subsection of scriptures known as the rich young ruler. It says, Then answered Petros and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed you. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that you which have followed me in the regeneration, which means in the new Genesis, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So, in other words, um, this word first in this parable, one of the things that it represents is those that are judged in this world becoming the judges in the next world. Verse 29 says, And everyone that have forsaken house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake. Um, again, I have here in bold red front, bold red font because this represents being poor in Christ or what Christ calls poor in spirit. Um, I have a study titled, Blessed Are the Poor in Spirit. We cover that in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. So if you have not seen that study yet, we go in detail of what it means to be poor in spirit. Um, and again, also this subsection of scriptures, um, we just went over it again recently in the Vineyard Workers Parable when we cover Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. It says, shall receive an hundredfold. And shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first, the first represents the rich, the unjust judges in this world, and in what it is talking about, the Pharisees and Sadducees. And I'm, I'm sorry, to, I must have accidentally deleted the rest of the word Sadducee. Uh, and again, it says, but the first that is in this world shall be last. Um, now we go back to Revelations, to um, chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. This subsection of scripture is known as Satan bound um, for a thousand years. It said, blessed and holy is he that is part of the first resurrection. So again, uh, this is what that word um, first means in this parable. It's talking about those that are going to be raised in the first resurrection, and they are going to be um, sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. It says on such the second. So this uh, word second represents the last resurrection which is death have no power but they uh, referring to um, that this word they is referring to those that have part in the first resurrection shall be priest of God's and of Christ. And shall reign with him a thousand years. So again, 
this first represents those um, that are last in this life. That we, that's on the bottom of the pyramid, that is poor, that suffered, that is afflicted. That in the next life, they will be first, raised in that first resurrection. Um, now we're going back here to verse 30. It says, um, and the last, and again, this word last is referring to the poor in spirit who did not judge or condemn people in this life. It says, shall be first. And again, this word first is talking about being um, raised in that first resurrection. So back to Matthew chapter 28, um, the parable of the two sons. But what think you? A certain man had two sons. Again, this represents two sons. As we go through this parable, you're going to see one of them represents a repented son. The other one represents an unrepented son. And he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. Now we're going to focus on what is it? What, what does it mean to go work today in my vineyard? When you go to Isaiah chapter 5. Verses 1 through 7. This is uh, this subsection of scriptures again is known as the song of the vineyard. If you go to verse 7, it says, For the vineyard of Yod Hevaf of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Yahada his pleasant plant. And again, Judah and Jew is not in the Greek nor Hebrew manuscripts. That word Judah. And Jew is completely made up. It is not a translation of any Hebrew or Greek word. Uh, this word here is Yahada, which represents the descendants of Yehuda. Um, so again, so we don't get too off track. We're talking about what does it mean to work today in my vineyard. The vineyard represents the house of Israel. Now we're going to get into the work that is supposed to be done in the house of Israel. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 1 through 9, this is when uh, Paul and Apollos, um, this subsection of scripture is known as Paul and Apollos, God fellow workers. <clears throat> now uh, verse 5 says, who then is Paul and who is Apollos? but ministers and again we go over this word ministers in the study which is greater when we cover matthew chapter 22 verses 20 through 28 this word ministers mean like a waiter that serves food he feeds god's people feed god's sheep or when you um, translate that into the parable of the vineyard he prunes waters and purges the branches on the true vine. Again, who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers, they are waiters. They get the food from God and that food that God's, God gives them, they take it and serve it to the people um, by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. In other words, he gave ministers to all men to eat the true word of God. Verse 6 says, I have planted. Now, we're getting into um, what does it mean to work now. Um, Paul said, I have planted. He planted the seed. Apollos watered the seed. And they do this by the preaching of the word of God. But Theos, which is the God of God, um, God the Father, give the increase. So then, neither it is he that plant." anything neither he that water but uh, theos that gives the increase now he that plant and he that water is one in other words they're in the body of christ and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor and again this labor is referring to the work that is done in the vineyard for we are laborers we are workers in the vineyard together with God the Father. You are Theos' husbandry. Now, this word husbandry in the King James Version Bible 
is translated from the Greek word Georgian. Now you cannot look up this word Georgian in modern day English to figure out its meaning. So what I want to do is go to another verse to help us define what Georgian means according to the scriptures. Again, we're going to go back to John chapter 15, verses 1 through 12, and this is the parable that Jesus gives, calling himself the true vine. It says, I am the true vine. And again, the true vine means the roots and the trunk. It says, and my father is the husbandman. Now, this word husbandman derives from the Greek word um, georgias. Um, Georgias is where the word Georgian derives from and Georgias when you translate that into a modern English it means farmer a tiller of the ground or a gardener so when it says um, you are um, Theos's husbandry it's saying you are Theos's farmers or gardeners that is responsible for pruning the vineyard. Verse 2 says, Every branch in me that produce not fruit is taken away. That means it is cut off and cast into the fire. And every branch in me that produce fruit, he purge it. In other words, this word purge kind of represents um, removing those unwanted leaves or undesirable fruits. That it may bring forth more fruit. In other words, the good fruit, the healthy fruit. So, um, the husbandry are people who are responsible for pruning other people. There are pastors, apostles, etc. When they see things in your life that is not right, it is their job to tell you and prune you and um, so you can produce good fruit and not bad fruit. Now, when you go back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, um, we're going to, um, in verse 9, the end of that verse says, Ye are theosis building. So if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20, this subsection of scripture is known as the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Verse 18 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple? It is the building, it is the dwelling place of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of Theos. Again, this is God the Father, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body, in your building, in your temple, and in your spirit. This is the spirit of your mind, which are God the Father's. So in other words, this husbandry represents people that are filled with the Holy Ghost that God used to do his will. So we're going back to the parable, Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 to 32, again beginning at verse 28. But what think you? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. Go minister the gospel. Go feed the sheep. Go prune the vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and went. So now what we're going to focus on in this parable and what it um, means to repent and then go. And to do that, um, first we're going to go to the book of Jonah because um, I believe Jonah is a perfect example um, of what it means that he um um, sent the first and the first said no but then he repented and went if you go to um, the book of Jonah chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 and again um, the correct translation of Jonah is Jonah so I have Jonah sent to Nineveh and flees to Tarsha it says now the word of your Hebafe came unto Jonah the son of Amittai saying arise go to Nineveh that great city and cry against it in other words he's sending um, Jonah into the vineyard to preach the gospel for their wickedness is come up before me but Jonah rose up and flee unto Charsha 
from the presence of yod heh vav -Eh. In other words, Jonah said, nope. Now we're going to go to Jonah chapter 3. And this subsection of scripture is known as when Jonah preaches to Nineveh. Uh, but um, Jonah um, chapter 2 um, is basically dedicated to the repentance of Jonah. The entire chapter is about Jonah repenting from fleeing from the presence of yod heh vav -Eh. And then when you get to chapter 3, um, he's basically um, go do what God told him to do. So in other words, he answered and said, I will not. That's Yonah in chapter 1. Chapter 2, Yonah repent. Chapter 3, Yonah went. So if you go to Yonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, verse 1 says, And the word of yod heh came unto Yonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid you, that I command you. So again, that's very important to remember when um, God the Father sent people into the vineyard to preach, you must only preach what he bids you, what he commands you to preach. So Yonah arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of yod heh um, So again, we're going over a few scriptures to help you understand what does it mean to repent? From here, again, I want to go to Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. Um, this subsection of scripture is known as the Pharisees, the tax collectors. We go over this verse 2 in detail in the study title, titled Pharisees and Publicans. So this is more like a quick review of that parable. So I'm just going to read through it for more details. You just have to go back um, to this study, the Pharisees versus the Publicans. Verse 9 says, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. Verse 10 says, Two men. Now these two men represents the two sons um, from the parable, um, the two sons that we're covering in Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 to 32. So again, these two sons went up to the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee. Now this Pharisee represents that second son. And the other one, a publican. The publican represents the first son from the parable of the two sons. The Pharisee stood and prayed to himself. God, I thank you that I am not as others men are extortioners, unjust, adulterer, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I possess. In other words, this second son, which is a Pharisee, um, he's a self, he's self-righteous and unrepentant. When you get to verse 13, it says, and the publican. Again, this publican represents that first son that said no, but then repented and went. It said the publican standing afar off, would not lift up so much his eyes unto heaven and beat upon his chest, saying, God, have merciful to be merciful to me, a sinner. This um, particular um, statement is um, bolded and in red font because it represents what it means to repent, confessing that you are a sinner and that you are in need of God the Father's mercy. Verse 14 says, I tell you, this man, talking about the first man, the publican, went down to his house justified, then the Pharisee, which is the second son, for everyone that exalted himself, this exalt himself means to place himself over others, to think he's better than others. It says, shall be abased, again, placed under others. And again, this is referring to that first and second resurrection. And he that humble himself, and this word humble means to place himself under others. If you go to Philippians chapter 2, verses 3, it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, like this second son, like this Pharisee, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man to his own thing, 
but every man also on the things of others. So this is what it means to humble yourself. And it says people that humble themselves like this in Philippians chapter 2 verse 3, it says shall be exalted. Again, this is talking about being raised in that first resurrection and becoming judges of those that are wicked in the new Genesis. Um, verse 30 says, and he came to the second. Now we back in the parable of the two sons and the second son represents that Pharisee. <coughs> um, I'm going to go back here. This second son represents those. If you go back to Revelations chapter 20 verses 1 through 6 when it says blessed and holy is he that had part in the first resurrection on such the second. So the second son represents um, this uh, second who's going to be raised in the second resurrection which the scriptures call the second death. So that's again the first kind of represents the son that's going to be raised in the first resurrection and the second son represents that son that is going to be raised in the second resurrection. So again, we're going back to verse 30. Um, he came unto that second son, which is a Pharisee, and said, Likewise, son, go work today in my vineyard. Again, when you go to Exodus chapter 28 and 1, and we cover this scripture in the um, lesson titled, Vineyard Workers Parable, when we cover Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. Um, and it reads, And take unto you Aaron your brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel. And again, remember the children of Israel represents the vineyard. That is, the children of Israel and the house of Israel is the same thing. So he's saying, Take from among the vineyard that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And again, this word minister means to feed God's people, to tell them whatever God tells them to, whatever God's command them to say, to feed the sheep, to prune, um, to prune the branches. So again, the second son represents that Levitical priesthood from the Old Testament. The scripture says, and he answered and said, I will go, sir. So unlike the first son who said he wouldn't go, but then repented and went, the second son said he will do the will of the father, but just never went. Um, if you go to Matthew chapter 23, verse 13, it says, but woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up. This word shut up means you close the doors to the kingdom of heaven against men. So when they're supposed to be pruning people and feeding them so that they enter into the kingdom of heaven, the scriptures say they shut the door. And this is the um, way Christ describes them not doing the will of God. They said they would go, but they shut the door against men. It says for you need to go in. So not only do they shut the door. But they standing outside the door when they shut it. Again, for you neither go in, neither suffer you them that are entering to go in. So they shut the door to the kingdom of heaven. And then they stand in front of the door, not allowing people to enter into eternal life. Not allowing people to enter into truth. And they, have, they do this by hiding secrets. Things that they're supposed to tell the people. Things that God tells them to tell the people. They keep it a secret. They hide it for their own personal vain glory. We have verse 31 in the parable of the two sons. It says, which of them two did the will of his father? So one of the things I want to get into really quick here is explain what the will of the father is. Um, and to do that, we're just going to go over a couple of scriptures. If you go to 2 Peter 3 and 9, it says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. 1 John 2 and 25, and this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. So the will of the Father is eternal life. Titus 1 and 2 says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie 
promised before the world began. So the gift of eternal life before, was already promised before Christ created the heavens and the earth. Now we go back to 2 Peter 3 9. It says, and some men counted slackness because this promise was made from the beginning of the world. Some people, what's taking so long for us to inherit this promise? The scripture says, but um, God is long suffering toward us, not willing. So this is the will of God, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So it is not God's will that any should perish, but all come to the knowledge of the truth. So again, which of them too did the will of the Father? Um, in other words, went and preached the gospel, led people unto salvation. And then again, um, if you go back to Jonah, when he went to Nineveh to preach the gospel, it says the entire city repented. So that means they entered into the kingdom of heaven. But then again, you have the Pharisees shutting up the doors to the kingdom of heaven so people cannot enter. So again, they say unto him, the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and harlots. And the reason he's saying the publicans and the harlots, because they represent the first. They represent those that are repentant. They represent the people in this life that is at the bottom of the barrel, the bottom of the pyramid, the last. Those that are judged and condemned and put to death and oppressed. And then we're going to go over a few scriptures um, in the scriptures um, just to help deepen your understanding of um, why the publicans and the harlots shall be first. If you go to Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13, uh, this subsection of scripture is known as um, Jesus calls Matthew. It says, and as Jesus passed forth, hence he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of customs. This means Matthew was collecting taxes. So he was a publican. He said unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass as he, as Jesus sat at the dining table in his house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, why eat your master with publicans and sinners? Again, here you have the Pharisees, that second son, despising others. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole, and um, whole represents perfectly healthy, need not a doctor, but they that are sick. But go and learn what this means. And basically all this is mean is really what he's talking about is not necessarily the physical body, but the spirit of your mind. Those that are perfectly sound in mind do not need a teacher. But those that are deceived, they the ones need the teacher. So the publicans and the sinners represent those that are deceived, don't know the truth. Christ came to give them the truth so that they can hear it and be set free and repent. So again, they that behold represents the condition of your mind, a perfect mind, um, full of spirit and full of truth. And a sick man represents a carnal and deceived man, a person that is in sin, and this is a person that lives a sin-free life. Christ says, I will have mercy. Again, this mercy represents grace under the new covenant and not sacrifice, which um, sacrifice and not sacrifice, which represents the sacrifices under um, the law in the old covenant. So again, Christ um let you know that people who keep the old law, the old covenant, it is going to be impossible for them to inherit the kingdom of God. Romans chapter 6, verse 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law. You're no longer under the law of Moses. You're no longer under the Torah, but under grace. That is the new covenant of Jesus Elohim. <coughs> It says, for I, I am not come to call the righteous. And again, this righteous refers to those um, who are moral. Those that are concerned with the principles of right or wrong. They know right from wrong. 
um, but sinners. These are people who are mentally corrupt, morally corrupt, carnal and deceived. It says he comes to call them to repentance. And again, this word repentance represents a metamorphosis of the mind. The scriptures call it a meta neoa, which means a supernatural change mentally. And that supernatural change is going from being carnal and deceived and to having a spiritual mind and living in truth. Um, again, we are talking about um, publicans and harlots and why they are called the first according to the New Testament. We just went over Jesus when he um, calls Matthew. And as soon as he calls Matthew, which is a publican, Matthew obey. Um, another uh, publican that I want to talk about is um, Zacchaeus. This is in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. We go over this subsection of scripture also in the lesson titled Pharisees versus Publicans. It says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zac uh, Zacchaeus. And again, Zacchaeus just means to be cleansed. And again, that's referring to a moral cleansing which was the chief among the publicans. So in other words, he was Matthew's boss and he was rich and he sought to see Jesus, who he was and could not for the press because he was little in stature. In other words, it was a big crowd. He was a small man and he ran ahead and climbed up in a sycamore tree. Again, what I just have here, uh, the sycamore trees are fig trees and from scriptures, we know that these fig trees was in Bethphage. So most likely this took place in Bethphage between Bethany and uh, the Temple Mount um, to see him. In other words, he climbed up into a tree to see him for he was to pass that way. And when the Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today I must abide at your house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all mumbled, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I have gave to the poor. So this represents his name. This is his cleansing. He was rich. He took advantage of the people, stole tax money. So I took half of my goods, given to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, by stealing, um, by bribing, it said, I restore him fourfold. In other words, Zacharias was repented. And Jesus said unto him, this day of salvation come into this house. For as much as he also is the son of Abraham, for the son of man is come to seek and save those which are lost. And again, this word lost is referring to those that are lost mentally, that has lost their mind. Crazy, insane, deceived, carnal. Um, so again, we're talking about publicans and harlots. Uh, we just went over a few verses talking about the publicans. Now I want to go over a verse talking about a harlot. If you go to John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, this is when Jesus delivers the adulterous woman. Again, um, Yahashua is not the correct translation of Jesus in Hebrew. It is a ta. Um, and a ta, when you translate it to the ancient Hebrew, means God crucified and resurrected. So um, again, uh, uh, Yahashua is not the correct name of um, Jesus Hebrew's name. So, verse 1, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. Again, the Mount of Olives and Bethphage is the same place. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him and sat down, and he taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. So this is a harlot or a whore, a prostitute. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, 
this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. And Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. And again, Christ said, um, let me just scroll back up to that verse. I will have mercy. This mean, and again, under grace, according to the new covenant, and not sacrifice, not condemning people, not killing people, not killing anything. Um, and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they sent to him, Master, this woman was taken in the very act of adultery. Um, and Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. Again, this is in the old covenant. We are not under the old covenant anymore. But what say you? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. In other words, for not keeping the law of Moses. But Jesus stood down with his finger and wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. In other words, he ignored them. Again, I just have a scripture here. If you go to John 3, 17, it says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And this is also what it means when it said, Christ came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He came to add to it, to make sense of it. The law in the old covenant governed people's um, actions. Christ came and added to the law so that it um, um, governs their thoughts, their morals. So again, he didn't say don't stone the woman. He just he added to the law of Moses said that he who is without sin cast the first stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground and they were churted. Being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those your accusers? Have no man condemn you? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn you. And again, God sent his son into the world. Um, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He told the woman, go and sin no more. So again, verily I say unto you, um, that the publican and the harlot go into the kingdom of God before you. And again, when he say the publican and the harlot go into the kingdom of God before you, is you, he's talking to the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. So he's saying publicans and harlots um, will be the first raised in that first resurrection, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees is going to be raised in the second resurrection. Verse 32 says, For Yachanan, um came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. In other words, you was not baptized unto repentance. But the publicans and the harlots believed him and repented. They was baptized, confessed their sins, and repented. And you, again, talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, when you had seen it, repented not afterwards that you might believe him. And this concludes this gospel.